I start to put tension on my string and draw back. I was like, okay, I'm answering. It's him. You can look at the horns when he's dead. I'm, I'm in, you know, in the zone. Let the arrow go. It's perfect. Uh, when they lose their front chores, yeah, you start, yeah, that's how you know. Went about five, ten more yards. He probably went 20 yards. He stepped in, which I get back up. I saw him follow up. We rushed for him here in Rod that night. We got like 156 and something like that. And then the next day, we came up to 153 even. You're listening to the White Cat Outdoors podcast, bringing you to the table where we talk about the outdoors. What is up, everybody? It's episode 63 of the White Cat Outdoors podcast, and you're hearing me, Frank, and you're going to hear quite a bit from Nick and Tom over there. Hey, what's going on? Hey, everybody. Glad to be in the studio. And got a special guest, very special guest. We've known him for a long time. We've been really good friends, hunting buddies for... Long time supporter, yeah. Team White Cat, ready yeah. to rock all the time. Yeah. Mr. Joseph Grimaldi. What's going on, fellas? Thanks for having me. Of course. So... Joseph, before we get uh, diving in, I feel like it's best we'll just start with uh, how we met and where this whole friendship started. This is back pre White Cat days. So this is yeah, BW. This was, yeah, this was we, we were still in high school. As I say, yeah, we were. Joe was. I off think doing I had the, just the adult things. Well. Yeah. No, because you were still in high school. You were at Tech with Doug. Oh, when, that's, that's right. You that's actually, right, yeah. Frank knew you before. Yeah, we went we coon did. hunting. Uh, yeah, with old Dallas and mm-hmm. yeah, so. Phil. Joseph, we'll start with uh, you had reached out, I believe, to Doug or his, and his buddy Steve. You found out how to coon dog mm-hmm. um, and wanted to go coon hunting. And that's the first night Tom and I met you. Right. And mm-hmm. basically, I think we were out behind Doug's house and just out coon hunting and stuff. It was the first time I ever met you and you know found out you know you were getting ready to head to the military. I think it was that basic training at that time. Yeah, it was uh, getting ready to ship to basic and... I knew it was going to be away for a while, so I wanted to have one last little hoorah, mm-hmm. hear the old 12-gauge bark, you know? And I can't remember back that far if we got anything that night, but I do remember... I think we did get one that night. It was right. like, we got it like right away, and then... That's about par for the course. Yeah, the rest of the night was spent just <laughs> running around the woods like idiots. I think we set a campfire up out in the back. And yeah. Yes, we did. But uh, tied Luke's shoes together. I was just going to say, we tied Luke's <laughs> shoes together. He fell asleep. Yeah. He fell asleep on that, si- that road sign table we had back mm-hmm. there. Um, that was hilarious. We're like, Luke, there's, the dogs are going. We got to go. And he like didn't even realize that his <laughs> shoes were tied together. He stumbled through the woods. <laughs> it was hilarious. But yeah, so then it was uh, after that night, Joe shipped off. And like I said, that was the first and last I had heard from you. And it, it had been a while. I was still in high school. And then about four years later, um, I was back, I guess it would be about May time for end of May. Actually, I know it was exactly last weekend in May because it was Memorial Day weekend. Right. Um, I don't even know how you got a hold of me, to be honest. You um, got a hold of Doug. Oh, did it? Was it Doug? Yeah, it was Doug. Yeah, so Doug was coming up to camp with us. We always go to Morrison Farms um, for Memorial Day weekend. Joe was, or Doug was like, hey, my buddy Joe that we hunted with like four years ago just got back. Like, you guys care if he comes? I'm like, I don't know. Like, bring him along. So I ran into Doug at Field and Stream. And, you know, I said, hey, what's going on? I haven't seen you in forever. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going up to, for Memorial Day, we go up to camp and we spend a good four days up there. And, you know, they told me about the hike and trails and the the waterfalls and all that. And and then, uh, yeah, I was up there that, that next weekend. Mm-hmm. That's That started a, quite a long journey for you at Morrison and stuff. That was your first experience in Morrison. And I remember you fell in love with the place and we're like instantly yeah i think you kind of i don't know exactly how you worded it but you told us um that there was no way that you could only do this once a year basically exactly. i was like lucky for you tom and i come up here every <laughs> other weekend um <laughs> just the view off that front porch i was like oh, watching that man. sun come up yeah drinking a cup of coffee it's it's a beautiful thing well so yeah joe started that summer coming up with me and nick every other weekend and it was probably what two or three years before you got hunting rights from the for the property i believe so i think it was two that that third summer they said i think we we're yeah we we're sitting at the table and stringer said you know what the hell why aren't you uh you doing you all hunt? this work up here yeah why aren't you hunting up here <laughs> and that, that was when it went to the executive 
decision with Ed, and Ed was like, well, yeah, he's been up here a couple years. Like, I think it's time, you know. And Smacked a gavel on the table. Yeah, ready to go. So Joe got his hunting rights, and I think – I think what came first was spring turkey was the first it was the, the next memorial day after that um i don't know if we've told this this turkey hunting experience out on air yet when you guys doubled yeah well and tom killed too that was the day before was it the day before you killed that turkey yeah oh because frank wasn't there yeah that morning oh, i should yeah, have I was gone killed that morning all right as sounds well. like you know the story better so why don't you lead into it so there might have been some drinking going on Friday night. <laughs> no. Believe it or not, there might have been. And I got up Saturday late, probably like 8.30, 9 o'clock. No, it, it was on Sunday because I left Sunday. Right, and then And Mon- then they okay, killed yeah, on that, Monday. Yeah, that's right. So drank Saturday night, probably Friday and Saturday night. But <laughs> That part of the story is true no matter what. <laughs> yeah. So Sunday I got up late, and it was probably like, Eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock, and couldn't convince anyone to go turkey hunting with me. So I was like, you know what? I'm going by myself. So I walked down, set up on this field, not like five minutes later, a group of gobblers comes out. And just like clockwork, they work right in front of me, and I smoke the lead one and call up Nick and Joe, and they come down on the side-by-side, the Kubota, to pick me up. And we're all celebrating, having a good time. Frank was being a loser and had to leave. He actually <laughs> ran over one of the fence posts in yeah. the driveway. <laughs> I would have been gone before that. you even got back with the bird, but I had run over the fence post and had to fix it. <laughs> so it was the next morning. I think we celebrated Sunday night too. And Monday morning, me and my dad went to another farm and Nick, Joe, and Trevor all hunted together up on the upper Lynn farm. And I'll let Nick and Joe tell this story yeah so as par for the course we were up a little late got out to the field a little late i think (laughs) uh i think we missed the initial roost for sure because it was light out (laughs) our way in um and we set up on the upper lynn farm and i think there's there's in the ground blind me and frank set up mind you yeah Mm, there wasn't a oh you guys were in a ground blind that's right me and trevor joe and trevor were yeah (laughs) Joe was in the ground blind, and I was actually leaning on a hay bale outside. So this was actually, before we get down there, I had told Joe, I said, you know, this is what's going to be the situation. I'm not going to be right next to you. So, you know, if birds start coming, you take a shot when you're ready, and I'll do what I got to do afterwards. Like, the main priority was getting Joe a bird, because at the time, you hadn't killed a gobbler yet. So, is that that's correct. That was my first yeah. bird. So, we set up, and I'm doing some calling, and... I'm not getting really any response. You know, I, I was, I pulled a few tricks out of the bag, couldn't get much of a response. Joe leans out the ground blind and asks, he says, hey, you know, I got this, I think it was one of them supersonic this dome the, calls. The Thunderdome, the Primo's. Yeah. Um, the asked if he could squawk dome. on a little bit. I said, hey, I mean, <laughs> I'm not doing anything over here, so go ahead, give it a shot. Joe rings out a few yelps and like right away, goblin like they just let just, off yeah like and they're not far i'm like holy shit here we go <laughs> like so they they must have been in the field or something like just on the edge but you, they you brought them out i got them the rest of the way yeah <laughs> i was uh i was just baiting them in joe hooked them up <laughs> drew them in like on fishing line and my face was about as red as their head <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so, oh my god this is happening. so yeah joe calls these birds start gobbling and it's so not only was it your first bird but you kind of called it in too Kind of. Yeah, I would say. I mean, because they, they, we did not get a single answer until, until that Joe primo call. Yeah. Out. Um, the old Thunderdome. And uh, within a minute, we see three redheads come popping up over the knoll in the middle of the field because the, the highest point of the field is right in the center. Mm-hmm. We're down on the low side, so we see them pop up over the top. And I like I said, I told Joe beforehand, as soon as you're comfortable, take your shot and we'll go for it. So they're... They're closing in, and they get to about 40 yards, and I was not ready for Joe to shoot because he said he had a 20-gauge. I figured he was going to wait for them to get him in a little bit closer. And they're coming, so. Yeah, so I'm just kind of nonchalant. I'm waiting. I'm ready, but I'm not, like, ready, ready. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I hear, boom, one turkey hits the ground rolling around, and the other two start flying away, and I'm like, I pulled up just like trap shooting, shot one, hits the ground, starts rolling, and Joe and I – 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was impressed. I was, it was, uh, it did it dropped right over on the run. And then I go running up to it. Joe jumps out of the ground blind, goes run up to him. We got two birds flopping around and just like that. It was like, I'd never gotten a double before. And that was Joe's first bird. And that like, I, I couldn't have been happier. I think we cooked up Joe's breast that, that day for lunch. That was awesome. Um, that was probably one of my favorite hunts. That was a good time. A little, um, little side story. The other kid, Trevor, uh, that was hunting with him, that was his second time turkey hunting. The first <laughs> time I took Trevor out, uh, I was hunting actually Frank's dad's lease on a, a local lease. And yeah, thank you. you. Tell me the exact road, would you? <laughs> Idiot. Uh, anyway, so me and Trevor set up where I think these birds are going to come out and strut in the morning. And we hear them gobbling off the roost, and they ended up not coming to where I thought they were. So, like, 8.30, we made a move into the woods where we last heard them gobbling. And I called for, like, two minutes before, like, the woods lit up with gobbles. And a group came in on a string. Trevor picked out the lead one and smoked his first gobbler, like, two it hours into double his first bearded bird. Yeah. So, so I, I told Trevor, I said, this is not normally how this happens, buddy, like... <laughs> This was an awesome hunt. And so he's obviously tagged out for the season. He's not hunting in PA anymore. Well, he comes up to Memorial Day weekend with us and goes out with those other guys, Nick and Frank. He didn't have a tag. He just wanted to sit and kind of experience yeah. it. Because he, like you said, you told him it doesn't always happen that way. Like, mm-hmm. that's just He a, wanted to see how it actually happens. Yeah. <laughs> and they go out and get a double. <laughs> so now Trevor's hooked that turkey hunting's easy. Yeah. Like, Simple. But, uh. I forgot that that was Trevor's second hunt. Mm-hmm. Like we kind of spoiled him on back-to-back hunts, killing birds. Yeah. Um, but I remember just like we were. I mean, how long were we sitting on that field edge? It couldn't have been more than an hour. It it wasn't like, an hour. It wasn't. <laughs> we an like hour. sat down. <laughs> I called for fifteen minutes. Joe called for five, and then it was like, like from the time we left camp, shot our birds, went back to camp. It had been probably an hour. <laughs> That's like, insane. It, and then, like I said, Trevor's, like, convinced that this is just easy stuff happens all the time. Yeah. Um, well, same here. I mean, that was my first bird. I'm like, that's true. This, this is easy. I mean, yeah. I have not killed a bird since, Me just either. for the record. <laughs> and that was, like, three years ago. Um, they get, uh, they're tricky. Sometimes it just seems like they work for you, and other times. Since then, I've got a designated 12-gauge just for just for turkey. There you now, go. Instead of that old bird shot. A uh, little more gauge. than the 20 gauge. Hey, you know, it, it rolled them, though, so. Did the trick. Yeah, we said so we were going right up to them. They were, they were done. Toasted. I think it scared them to death more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think after that, you know, we worked all summer, like, you know, you've been doing. And then uh, got, got, I think it was your first deer since you got back from the military, right? It was. Um, I think. Joe had seen a stand I was hunting over at one of the pieces and fell in love with its setup and stuff. I was like, I need to get in that stand. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right. So I put Joe up there and like that night killed a deer and got that one out. Like it was, it was a pretty good snowstorm too, if I remember right. Yeah. It was coming down pretty good. It's cold, like that heavy snow. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, you had a lot of good times up at camp for sure. And obviously more coming more than I can count. I mean, I, I love it up there. Mm-hmm. Oh, you had heck of a an archery season up there this year. Had some fun. Yeah, we did. Rutcation. Yeah. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about some of your hunts from this year up there, because I know you seem to have more action than anybody else up oh, at Rutcation this year. Is this a sore got, subject? The <laughs> one that got away. <laughs> now, I had always kind of wondered, you know, because they have some antler antler rules, you know, want the, want the older deer. And I had you know seen some pretty good bucks in you know on a normal day i would have shot every single one of them mm-hmm. but now i'm like ah compared to what's on the wall they're all kind of small and then just out of the blue i mean i wasn't seeing anything and i was getting ready to come back in for lunch and i just seen this i all i seen was antlers well i uh, i saw a doe come out so i was just more paying more attention to her and took my binoculars down and i just seen this mammoth of a deer in I mean, mammoth to me anyways, but mm-hmm. I mean... A lot bigger than what you were passing up. Oh, yeah. I mean, I bet he went 135, 140. Yeah, I mean, that's... More well, than That's a without seen. question. Yeah. It's getting an arrow, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, if he comes in range... Uh, so, the doe was kind of leading him across the field, and I grunted at him, and he stopped and 
kind of looked my way and uh, the doe bleated or did whatever she did and he took off after her again and I grunted again like a little more aggressive and he stopped and turned into it and I'm like oh here he comes and then he, he got to about 60 yards and took off and never seen him again that's I mean it's a heartbreaker because 60 yards is a chip He's, shot with a gun oh my yeah. god <laughs> it's oh I can't even imagine and then uh so we talked about it the ne- or that night over some beers and some good food. Uh, made a game plan for the next day. Went out and saw him again. He did just about the same thing, but on the opposite food plot. On the other side of the headrail. And then he did a, stayed about 70, 60 yards away. And I'm like, oh, my God, he's huge. I got to have him. <laughs> so the third day, I same area but i took a climber down and i'm like he's been coming out of this bedding area so i got right on the edge of it the wind was right but walking down in there that morning i couldn't see anything and just a whole bunch of dough blew me out and i sat there gotten i mean obviously i got up in the tree sat there and uh another doe came out and behind me and blew me out and i'm like all right we gotta go it's you know it was the yeah. last day of hunting anyways so that's, I mean, my guess is that buck knew that stand. Um, I mean, he what was in his first breeding season. Right. Um, mm-hmm. That stand's been there a while. My guess is he knew where it was. Um, but like you said, he showed up in two different food plots that you can shoot from that but stayed just outside of the kill shot. He knew. Um, I mean, I mean, that's how they get that size. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But now after seeing a buck like that, you know it's a – that was the yeah. biggest buck I've ever seen on the hoof. That's what I mean. So, like, once you can put your eyes to a buck of that, you know, gets to past two and a half years old, mm-hmm. it's a totally different animal. Yeah. Like, they look like a horse. Mm-hmm. Next, I mean, that doe probably looked like a fawn. His body was huge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. They get that big swollen stomach and the swell mm-hmm. in their back and their neck kind of goes into their shoulders. They don't really have much of a neck, I guess. It's just I mean, like, it, mm-hmm. it looked like he just walked out of the gym. He was all <laughs> balled up. Yeah, well, it's. I mean, you, we were hunting probably right at the peak of the rut. Yeah, um, so he was nice and slimmed down. He yeah, was I think all we, I mean, we were just days before, like what they consider lockdown. Yeah, because it seemed like early when we first got there, bucks were cruising. Uh, my dad killed that first weekend we were there mm-hmm. uh, with a buck cruising. So it was. I think, like you said, I think we hit it just right. But it's tough when you're not hunting that property all the way up to that point. Yeah, just kind of shot in the dark, but. Um, that, was, that was a fun day when your dad got that that really nice buck. Yeah, that was his first and only podcast. We had him jump on, tell his. Really? Yeah. Oh, that was not. That's been on twice. Oh, that's right. He was for on the for the Father's, Father's, Father's day. day special. Sure. You're right. I guess. Uh, many beers. <laughs> that's uh, getting up. M- remember, all the, remember all the wind that we were having? Oh, my God. Yeah, the wind was nasty up there. And, it, and the, we got a warm front. It was like 70 degrees in the first week in November. Yeah, it didn't help. It was like we had, I think, everything from snow to 70 in that week. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was ridiculous. Like how we were the deer burning. don't even know what to do. How am I supposed to know Make sure. what I'm supposed to be doing? It was it was a tough hunt. Um, but seeing a buck like that, I know, just like hooks you so oh he's he's got something coming to him next year <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i'm gonna get a saddle and i'm gonna climb right above his bed there you go <laughs> you better get in there early before he gets in there um start the night before mm-hmm. yeah Joe, when he gets out of his bed just after dark you slip in oh yeah stay there, there till go. tomorrow he, uh, you probably sleep in a saddle they're actually pretty comfortable but I know you. You guys haven't even been in them. So no, I've never been in. You guys one, can't even. I don't, you guys can't even add anything to that combo. So I can definitely add that I would not spend the night in a saddle. No, I wouldn't spend the night in anything I'm much more than a bed. Those tree diapers. <laughs> <laughs> Sex swing. <laughs> Sex swing. Um, one of the I guess main reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast, Joe, was just because you are a vet and um, we touched on that briefly. But then just like how like the outdoors has been important to you and i think the best way to lead into that is story um about you and tommy and your dad Uh, i think was that last rifle season uh it was not this past one yeah Yeah, so 20 yeah i guess would have been 2019 yeah before rifle season so if you could go through that story because like that was probably one of the coolest hunting stories i have ever 
heard and I can't, I mean, I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm a part of it, but I was helped process some deer. So I feel like I, I was texting you the entire time. Yeah. I was going so down, like, I felt like I was there. Joe, yeah. Joe was, uh, giving me the play by play. So it was kind of like, you were basically yeah, there. I was kind of, I was there. Nick in was in the sure. blind. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to like tell that story, cause like that's all, like I said, by far one of the coolest hunting stories I've ever heard. Um, all right. So this was the last day of 2019 rifle season. Um, I didn't realize it was the last day. It was of the, the very season. last day. I guess um, I did realize because I was there when, like, I was there helping process the deer. But so uh, my brother, my brother told me only. Well, he told my sister too, but he didn't tell my parents he was coming home. And he got early leave. He stationed out in Fort Riley, Kansas. Um, so he was driving home from Kansas, and he was fighting weather the whole way back, and. Uh, but he had only told me and my sister that he was coming home. Uh, so I'm like, all right, well, me and dad will be out hunting, you know, and we have like an adopted grandfather kind of deal. And we were out at his farm out in Albion. And so I'm like, all right, well, here's the deal. You're going to get in right around eight o'clock. And I'm like, obviously we'll be long out in the woods by then. So I'm like, I'll sit dad in a spot where I know he's comfortable and, you know, knows where, how to get back to the barn or whatever. And then I'm going to go, quote unquote, a hundred, couple hundred yards down the line. I got dad set and I instantly went back and jumped in the truck. And by this time, my brother had gotten to the house and I already had hunting clothes laid out for him. And because he didn't have anything since he'd been in the military, he's grown and lost weight and all this, whatever. So I picked my brother up and I'm like, all right, we got to run, give mom a hug, whatever. So we get back out to the farm. He's been stationed out in kansas for x amount of months and stuff and basically like sees mom for a few minutes and you're like we're going hunting yeah (laughs) bye mom (laughs) and i think because being out in kansas and not being able to because he's so busy with the military he just wanted to hunt because he sees all these massive whitetails out there and he's just got the itch um so you know kind of said bye to ma got in the truck again uh and we walked out to where dad so i started walking to where my dad was and I told my brother to kind of loop, you know, make a big loop and try to push something to him and, you know, walk up out of the ravine and surprise him. We did that. Dad wasn't in a stand. <laughs> of course what not. The heck? So I'm like, all right, well, let's walk back to the barn and uh, I'll kind of walk in first and give you a thumbs up out the door if he's sitting in there. And so we got back to the barn and dad's in there by the wood stove warming up and <laughs> eating a bowl of chili and it's like... 10 o'clock in the morning so dad oh my god dad lit up he just gave the biggest yeehaw and (laughs) spilled his bush light and that's hilarious (laughs) about spilled his chili on himself and they're all in tears and the you know all the other hunters are like fighting back tears and Mm -hmm. i'm like mission complete yeah i'm like this was awesome and then i'm like well you know what tommy's home i don't even really care if i get anything now yeah. So I had my, my 300 wind mag, and Tommy had my grandfather's old Remington 35. Lever action, iron sights. And that just tells you what your tax dollars are doing to uh, <laughs> military training because not, I don't know, not a half hour later, me and Tommy both had dough on the ground, and he shot his 100 yards iron sights, just dropped it dead in his tracks. Mm-hmm. And he yells, here he comes. And I thought, I'm like, here he comes. He's got a buck. And then it's just a big fat doe, and I dropped her right in her tracks. And you know, by noon, we were both tagged out. So I'm like, all right, it's the last day, we got one more push. Uh, you know, because after getting it back to the, getting the deer back to the barn and in the truck, whatever. So we got one more push, we're gonna set dad in a spot, and sure as sure as shit, he got a, a doe on that last drive. So all three of us t- got our doe doe tags filled that day. That's it was pretty, pretty exciting. Wild. Oh, yeah. I mean, for it all to play out as well as it did, you know, like... Yeah. It was perfect. Yeah, yeah, your dad had no idea he was going to come home, and <laughs> yeah. you surprised him, and then you all ended up getting deer together. That's just... That's a great story. I mean, it's it's a feat, especially, like, in PA, with as many hunters are out there, like, to get one deer in your group is, like, it's awesome. Like, everybody's cheering, mm-hmm. hooting, hollering, and then for... To get that phone call, you know, like, I got one, you know, oh, I got one, too, and then dad gets one, like... It's 
We had a full truck on the way home, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you brought it down to the house, and I think we got kind of – we, I think we did, what, like two of them, I think? Just got them quartered up for you, and then you took them over to McDonald's. Yeah. Um, McDonald's meats, it's not, we're not, there's not a fast food restaurant that processes deer out here. <laughs> it's a little meat shack. You know, oh. This is Jack McDonald's. It's Ronald's brother. They're Ronald's <laughs> brother. Actually, I don't even know if it's Jack McDonald. I just know it's no, McDonald's. We, we did. It's not Ronald's brother, though. No, we did my, not. we did my, or our two. Mine, and, we did mine and Tommy's at your house, and then uh, we took dad's because, he likes to make sure they're they're down. Um, so the, <laughs> the that's a really nice way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's like a meat and cheese tray. You know, you got there some you deer go. meat in the rear and then the up in the front end. It's like, board is that what they call? Yeah, it? yeah. Swiss cheese up front. You know. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, and then we ended up giving giving dad's deer away to somebody I can't remember, but that's good. There's a lot of programs around this area for meat know, donations. And, yeah, talking processing those like. I think it's just the right time for the old smoke a little break. little smoke break action. Old Which smoke we haven't break. done a smoke break in a while because we haven't had a guest in studio. No, we haven't. So we actually, you're one of the first that I told ahead of time <laughs> that there was actually going to be a smoke break. All right. Um, usually I spring it on them right now. <laughs> so I figured I'd give you a heads up so you could think about it ahead of time. All right. Um, so go ahead and lay us down on this week's smoke break smoke break um we were talking about you know processing and uh food and all that and the way i like to do my my back straps is very very simple i use a little bit of use a little bit of salt a little bit of pepper a little tiny dash of garlic garlic powder and then i use brown sugar how, how much brown a healthy sugar? amount uh, yeah because that's what threw me it's the first time I've heard of somebody using brown sugar on their back straps. So that's what intrigued me about this recipe. Well, I kind of like... Uh, Measure with your heart. You're Italian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, just uh, till it looks right, I guess. Um, just a few... I know exactly what you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just... That's how Tom know. does it. Get, a, get a good pinch with your fingers and... So are you, like, right. kind of, like, rubbing it in or just, like, sprinkle it on top, like... I sprinkle it on top because once it gets in the pan, it kind of melts. So just, in, okay, so this is pan... It's more like a glaze like a, then. Yeah, it's it kind of caramelizes, and it makes it... You know, you got the garlic and the salt and pepper, and it, it kind of gives it a sweet... So you're doing it in the pan, like on the stove? Yeah, and I I, I like mine rare, so... That's the way. It's that's the only, that's way, the only way, way. So they're more you're or less... at the right table. <laughs> um, I guess rather black and blue they're black and red so i mean mm. i just flash them you know a minute each side and oh that's uh, nice sear that's the way to do it just i mean it, it's hot too you gotta oh yeah mm-hmm. so what does you said like the brown sugar kind of like just caramelizes it on the outside so it kind of yeah. gives it a little just like a little, sweet a little candied taste you know hmm. i'm gonna have to try that because like i said we the reason we do the smoke break is just trying to get new recipes, new recipes because there's so many different ways to prepare a game i know we had um Kyle and Ryan out of Michigan uh, from Deers and Beers, they're talking about venison turnovers. Mm. They're using like fill and puff pastry with like hot pepper cheese and ground deer meat and baking it. And it's like, <laughs> that sounds slim, man. I, I was like, man, we're like, usually it's just like grill the steaks here or there, you know, yeah. like different seasonings. And they're out here, Gordon Ramsay. They're going up crazy. There. Yeah. And but, I uh, guess, I guess uh, as I'm getting more and more into the outdoors you know before the military i would you know just do rifle season occasionally go squirrel hunting but now that i got more time on my hands and i'm starting to learn you know you got a freezer full of meat what are you gonna do with it no we've even seen just your progression because like you said you didn't do a ton of hunting um i mean like and you had a bow and stuff but you seem to start shooting more you know as we started hanging out more and stuff like it you got i've seen you get way more involved in hunting and especially bow hunting yeah yeah that's for sure Um, i had an old beat you know an old beat psc spider it was my first bow when i was maybe 14 and you know sat in the closet for a long time so as soon as i got home i got some had some jingle in my pocket gotten got a nice new hoyt and i still got that thing i love it that's a sweet looking bow short and compact for that's what mm-hmm. I switched like up me, to. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I switched to a little little short corn compact one. Um, the one thing I did want to get into that um, 
is new for you, I guess. Not really new, but like your fly fishing and then your cabin that you got right on the river in the mountains. And tying flies. And tying flies, yeah. Oh, so yes. Like it's like it's been neat for me to see like now you're like branching out and doing your own stuff because like, like I don't do any fishing down in that way. You pretty much, at this point, you're like, you know, I can figure this out and – um, this started, uh, my cousin Danny, he's, uh, he actually won a bunch of your, I think yeah, he won some, some of your stuff and stuff. Um, well, Danny is a fly fisher, fly fisherman. Um, and he kind of got me into it. My dad had done it for years and years. Uh, he used to tie or teach fly tying at gem city. And this is like when I was a little three or four, maybe. Mm-hmm. So I had always, never had the patience to do it and as i get older i'm like all right this is you know dad's retired now and he's looking for stuff to do i'm like let's you know bust out of that old fly vice and teach me something and so you know i made some really crappy woolly buggers and he's like ah you made a fly you made a fly he's like here's my orvis book you take my vice home for a weekend and just see what you can do and then my cousin danny he got me into it and then my dad once i you know once i got a a roll cast down and you know just a simple over the shoulder cast whatever my dad gave me my grandfather's my grandpa died when my mother was four and since dad was a fly fisherman my grandma had gave him all of my grandpa's i mean this is before onyx and yeah so these maps are dated 1958 yeah, it's a little before Onyx. Yeah, a little. I mean, <laughs> I think Onyx was fifty nine or sixty. Yeah, no. somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> just about. I mean, just just before Onyx. Yeah. So I got my I got my grandfather's old maps and a bunch of his old flies. I mean, I won't ever use them, but I mean, they're gonna go in a a little shadow box. But I got a bunch of my grandpa's old maps, and you know, I started unfolding them and seeing little X's and you know, little little peas where you could park and trail marks and i'm like again with my cousin i'm like we got to start fishing some of this i'm like this is my grandpa you know our grandpa's and because danny has my grandfather's fly rod and it, it's hanging above the mantle and he's like once we're both good he's like we're each gonna catch a fish on that i was gonna say who you guys, what are you guys what are you put wrestling for <laughs> uh but yeah and then i just we bought a little we bought a little camp down in uh down in Sheffield PA and down the mountains heart of the Allegheny National Forest and we got Tyanester Creek runs I mean you could throw throw a rock off the back porch and hit it and uh, Is it is it natives down there or what do you guys there's catch down in there? About six miles away from our camp, from our front porch, uh, there's a little creek called Minister Creek. And if you start heading up stream you can get into the natives i haven't i mean i've seen them but I, they're they're still up there for a reason because they're very very <laughs> nobody's finicky. <out> there. <laughs> very finicky and they don't you got to present those flies just right and so is there they, something different about catching a fish on a fly that you made oh, it's the best feeling i mean anybody can go buy a worm from from the bait shop but or you know go get a pack of googans at field and stream or whatever but i don't know it's just, just so, adds another element to yeah it. so how where do you get your ideas for like your flies and stuff like do you try you know one color and it's like oh well, this one's not really hitting so you go home and make a few more with a different color or different variations like where's your inspiration for your flies um i guess a lot of the, for the streams and uh they have hatch reports like what kind of bugs are hatching for the spring and where uh, where do you get that info? I've, I've never heard of that. I googled it. Dad has a. My dad had a book, and it's like a live thing. Like what time of year? What time of year? What huh. they look? They got a picture of the actual bug, and they got a picture of what the fly is supposed to look like. And hmm. huh, I did not know that. You know, if it's not working, adjust your colors a little bit, and that's wild. That's way more in depth than I thought. You know, I <laughs> like, and that's cool. But like, I, I didn't realize that it was like. There's literally a book of like at this time of year. This is what's hatching. This is what they look like, mm-hmm. and then you're essentially trying to mimic it with string and feathers exactly. and other materials. Um, I gotta um, ask: Have you used any deer hair from something you've killed to make a fly yet? Um, my dad had a 
a good patch of hair from a deer that he got. Nothing I've nothing I've shot yet. Um, I mean, that's, that's like happen. full circle. Like go kill yeah, a turkey yeah. or a deer or something and start making. Actually, fun. I I did use um, turkey feather from our double. Really, I plucked a little one out of the fan. And you catch some, anything on it? I have not. Oof. They're in the they're in the fly box though. And see, Luke's, trout season's coming up. Luke's got my great grandpa's old fly box. That's awesome. And I know Frank's dad has some of his old lures and tackle yeah. boxes and stuff, but. Um, so I know the sentimental value of that rod that's it's, hanging it's, on the wall. I'd be afraid to even take it off the wall, to be honest with you. But yeah, yeah. same. I mean, <laughs> I would probably want to put a fish in a bucket and yeah. then just like dip it in. <laughs> come on, come well, on. Well, yeah. got a fish. <laughs> yeah, take it to like Mallory Run or something. Yeah, but <laughs> now that's I, I didn't realize that it got that involved with the fly fishing. Right. Um, if you want to get those little natives, that's how you do it. I have yet to get one. Uh, Catching a brown trout, though, I mean, in those little mountain streams where the pines are all hanging over, and you probably feel like you're out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, it's amazing! There. It's very peaceful. I've only been in the Alleghenies. Me and Tom turkey hunted down there one time, so we'll have to you got meet a place up to this. Go now we go down there rattlesnake hunting. All the oh, time. that's I get yeah, not that not that area. No, not that, that area, but that in, mountain range. Yeah, um, which is some you guys don't have snakes in that area, do you? Oh yeah, not that I've seen, but. Um, there's a little bar. I could tell you where they are. <laughs> we'll find them for you. Oh, you know, I was just a boot box, and I seen a pair of snake boots. I'm like, I got to get into this with these guys. <laughs> the snake hunt, that's coming right up. Jared yeah, actually sent, snapped me. He got his snake permit already. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Um, uh, that's yeah, yeah you got to camp down there. That'll be If fun. we can get into snakes down there, that would be yeah, awesome. We could even go down there and stay there. It's cuts two hours out of our drive to go Absolutely. anywhere else yeah so. yeah where you guys you guys go down like towards benazette area don't you uh, uh there's some around places. there and then the other places we try and keep off air just because there's nobody else snake hunting in that area right i understand um, elk county is very common for snakes so we're not like giving away any trade secrets yeah there's a lot way. of people and... like we can't hunt that area without running to somebody else in snake hunting but the other spot we keep to ourselves just because and uh john royer's uh with leatherwood outdoors he's a guy that's been snake hunting since it was legal in pa Mm -hmm. and he's got some spots like that that he's like yeah because we talked to him a little he's like yeah we hunt a little bit here and then some other places and he just keeps it very vague (laughs) um just like the fishing spots yeah exactly exactly. your grandpa's got that map Mm -hmm. and i haven't seen that map and i don't expect to ever see it like that's Mm -hmm. secret little honey holes you know you might take somebody there because we've taken people to where we snake hunt, but it's like you don't tell anyone Blind, about this. You're blindfolded <laughs> yeah. for the last two yeah. miles of the ride. This will freaking kill you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, if you get down in the cabin, there's a couple of them hanging on the wall, so you'll see them. Nice. A couple snakes? No, no, no. The maps. <laughs> oh, the maps. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I was going to say, I'm like, yeah, what? <laughs> um, yeah, I found them under the porch and just kind of nailed them up there. Just tacked them up. Yeah. They got bigger balls than me. That's for sure. I, I need the tongs. Um no, but yeah, like I was saying, there's a little bar like eight tenths of a mile from our from our camp, and I asked about it because they had a really big one mounted above the bar, and I'm like, "Is there rattlesnakes around here?" And it, all the old heads kind of looked at each other, and they're like, <laughs> "Should we tell them?" And they're like, "Well, it depends on where you're at on the hill or whatever. Mm-hmm. Not under the camps or not down by the creek. They're like it's an elevation. Higher. 1800 feet is usually yeah, and that's up towards the top of the hill. Mm-hmm. Yeah." So I think we're gonna have a little fun. We'll maybe try yeah, something new. Definitely this year. Maybe Joe's into doing a little rattlesnake hunting. Absolutely. Getting a little crazy with the old venom. Um, is there anything else you want to cover, Joseph? I mean, I think it was really cool to get you on and talk just hunting with you. That's we're getting ready to get into turkey season. Um, hoping to line up some turkey related guests here soon. Um, but uh. I said it was just cool to talk to you, talk hunting like we always do. So absolutely. Um, if there's nothing else, we'll we'll close it out here. But um, before we do that, this is another one I prepared you for. It's only because we're friends. Usually, I just spring this on people. <laughs> um, before we close it out here, we're gonna ask you what your write it in pen is. Write it in pen. All right. So we were talking about my brother shooting iron sights, and it's something I, you know, I practiced with my bow and. 
comes from an old movie, uh, Mel Gibson, The Patriot. Aim small, miss small. There you go. I like that. You know? That's it's good. definitely true because I remember when we were just getting into bow hunting, we used to put like a thumbtack or mm -hmm. a flower bud on yeah. the target, and that was what you were aiming at. Yeah. Rather than having a two-inch circle down there at 20 yards, you have an eighth-inch circle that you can just barely see, but your pin is that size, so it just you just cover that. The smaller target you have, the tighter a group you're going to hold. Yep. Yeah, and that's one thing I've noticed. Joe's always been a really good shot with rifles. Like, yeah. Obviously, and I think that <laughs> in a bow, um, which I'm sure military has a lot to do with that. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, Did some competitive even, shooting and all that good stuff. and Even when we were out at camp, like middle of bow season, we'd get back from a morning hunt or something. Joe's like, where's the target at? I'm going to go shoot, you know, start throwing mm -hmm. arrows in between hunts. <laughs> make, make sure, you know. Yeah, which I'm, I'm horrible about doing. I should shoot way more in the season, but mm -hmm. um, – with that, uh, thanks again, Joseph, for Absolutely, guys. joining yeah, us. Yeah, it was good me. having um, you on, buddy. We'll hopefully update with another turkey killed this season because I, I got a good feeling you're going to kill another one this year. We'll, I think you so. entering in the turkey scramble? I am. So Excellent. We got uh, the White Cat turkey scramble coming up soon. I'll um, bust out that old Thunderdome again. Heck yeah, Worked two for last two. Time. <laughs> um, on that note, everybody, thanks for listening. Uh, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, but also – we just did a podcast with Whitetail Legacy Podcast over out of Illinois. Um, check that podcast out, episode 172, uh, Drunk in a Cabin. So check that one out. <laughs> That's and, what they called it. Yeah, with that, get outside. <laughs>